Okay. So, um, I'm not sure if uh, they've already introduced me, but um, I haven't seen uh, earlier the, the direct. So, welcome to this tutorial. My name is Eduardo Cetin. I am uh, I am a PhD student at King's College London, uh, part of the SEER lab, and uh, I'm, I will be introducing uh, generative adversarial networks. And uh, yes, would you guys uh, go through the first papers uh, in this uh, innovative field, show you some of the cool results, uh, and also do some live coding and implementation, which hopefully will go well, and uh, will show you some of the capabilities uh, that uh, this class of methods uh, has. So, uh, let's see. All right, I'm connected. So, let's, uh, let's start with the, with the notebook. Uh, this notebook uh, is uh, in the AI Core uh, GitHub uh, under tutorials. Uh, you, can find, uh, you can find it under Generative Adversarial Network. Here you will have a link uh, to the to this Google Colab, uh, which you can just access by opening in, in Colab. Uh, yeah, we will be using uh, this resource as uh, personally I believe it's just amazing how Google gives you pretty much a free GPU for you to use uh, and uh, play around with. So let's start by introducing generative adversarial networks. So exactly, exactly what is the GAN framework? You most likely by now have heard of it as it's probably one of the most famous breakthroughs that uh, happened in machine learning in the last five years. And uh, the purpose is to have uh, an unsupervised method that uh, starts, uh, uh, starts by representing a particular data set uh, in some distributional manner. So given a data set of, of, uh, or a data set of our likings, we want to encapsulate the distribution that uh, generated that data set, building a model that is able to replicate and capture the structural consistency within our data. And particularly, we want to do that by building a sampler. So a model which can generate uh, new data, potentially, coming from the same distribution that generated uh, our data set uh, itself. So first of all, uh, uh, there are many videos uh, showcasing the capabilities of modern GAN. Here there is one which I think it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, this is one of the latest uh, works in GANs. And uh, every image you see in this video is, is not of a real person, but was actually generated by StyleGAN2. That's uh, one of the most uh, modern uh, GAN architectures. And uh, entirely, entirely from scratch. So only based on uh, some uh, prior high dimensional data set. And this really shows how impressive the generation capabilities are and how, how well the GANs can actually generate extremely high dimensional data, something that uh, almost no other method uh, can do currently, apart from maybe VQVIs. But um, still, also VQVIs are probably a bit far from that. And uh, yeah, so firstly, let's introduce the basic concept of GAN. And uh, it all started from uh, one paper by Ian Goodfellow, which uh, was called uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. And this paper introduced the concept, the main concept of GAN, which is having uh, two different uh, deep models, a generator, a generative models, or a generator G, and a discriminator D. And uh, the idea was to make them compete against each other in order for the generator to increasingly generate better samples that would encapsulate better our distribution. So, yeah, as you can see here uh, directly from the paper, uh, is a framework for estimating generative models via an adversarial process. This highlights the fact that the generator and the discriminator compete against each other. How, they do, how do they do that? Well, they do that mathematically through one key equation, which is uh, this one, which highlights the optimization process of both, of both the discriminator and generator network. So both the discriminator and generator play the two-player minimax game with the, the given function, where the goal is for the discriminator to effectively label the samples, either coming from our data, so x coming from our p data, or generated by our generator, represented by g of, uh, g of z where Z 
is uh, some uh, well, is some latent variables coming from uh, a noise source, which is uh, a distribution that uh, simply generates uh, random data. Uh, usually, it's uh, normal data, so with z just being uh, random uh, variables uh, drawn from uh, from a normal distribution uh, with uh, with uh, mean uh, with uh, mean zero and standard deviation one. And as you can see, this, op this optimization uh, is uh, is uh, is exactly a cross-entropy objective. And therefore, you can uh, understand the discriminator as effectively a classifier, trying to assign the class of 1 to our real data and the class of 0 to our fake data, data that was generated uh, by GZ. And again, therefore, reiterating what I just said, the main concept of GAN is that we have uh, two networks that we train in uh, an alternating fashion. Firstly, a generator that uh, takes as input a random variable z from a fixed noise distribution p of z and outputs the, some generated samples, which ideally would, we would want to be close or we would want to be drawn from the same distribution that generated our data. So we want to be close to our, the real data distribution p data of x from our data set, represented by our data set. And secondly, a discriminator, which, as I just mentioned, can be interpreted as a classifier, which takes as input uh, either samples from uh, our data set, uh, so X real, or generated uh, from our generator G, so X gen. And for each of these samples, X outputs a probability, D of X, which ideally is proportional to how likely its input X came from our data set. And therefore, D is trained as a classifier, as I just said, by maximizing this objective, which is just a cross-entropy objective. And G, instead, is trained to adversarially fool the discriminator. So having access to the current weights of the discriminator, G utilizes this knowledge through gradient descent uh, or Adam to maximize the probability that this, the discriminator would assign it by minimizing this cross-entropy objective. So the, the two networks are effectively competing against each other. One, D, tries to maximize the objective V, while the second one, G, tries to minimize the same objective. Therefore, you can understand, uh, you can understand this optimization as uh, two models which try to catch up to each other, in some sense. With at each iteration, G exploiting the current uh, discriminator to improve its samples, and uh, at the round in which D is optimizing, D will try to bring the probability of the samples generated by G down and the probability of our data up. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is a quite intuitive uh, understanding of the optimization process. And uh, yeah, therefore, summarizing, uh, two neural networks are pitted against each other where you have a classifier and a generator, and uh, therefore, as also shown by this picture from uh, one of the GAN tutorials given by Ian Goodfellow, from the discriminator point of view, the discriminator um, tries to make the probability that it outputs for the fake data near zero, while uh, our generator tries to, bring, tries to bring it near one. Um, and, uh, of course, the, both G and D are differentiable functions, and they can, the, therefore G can exploit knowing the structure of D to optimize itself to adversarially fool it and maximize its probability. Even though it generates generated data, tries to bring the probability of its data up and therefore closer to the real data distribution, which D can see. The algorithm, as given in the original paper, um, can be seen uh, as, uh, therefore, an alternating optimization trained with the uh, first-order methods, so in this case, stochastic gradient descent. And, uh, yeah, here it mentions that uh, the steps uh, that you can optimize the discriminator for, uh, k is an hyperparameter, however, in the original paper they used one, but uh, also for most of the other, of the other further methods, um, they also alternate the training, uh, doing one step of generator training with one step of discriminator training. So, as you can see, the, the first inner loop is for k steps, so in our case 1, we train the discriminator, 
So sample a mini batch of noise from uh, our prior distribution, PG. Sample a mini batch of real examples from the generated distribution P data. And optimize this cross entropy objective by ascending its stochastic gradient. So maximizing this objective, maximizing our cross entropy objective. Um, subsequently, we therefore, uh, we, after we finish uh, training of the discriminator, we train the generator. We sample a mini batch of noise we, from uh, our noise prior, and uh, by outputting uh, our generated samples, we minimize the same, the same objective that the discriminator was maximizing, again uh, through mini batch uh, gradient descent. This time descending the stochastic gradient, so trying to minimize the same loss. Uh, as you can see, the, the first term that uh, maximizes the probability of the data, it's not present in the optimization of the generator, simply because it's independent of any generator val variable. As you can see, there is no G in the first term of the cross-entropy objective, because the discriminator is just trying to maximize the probability of the real data. So it's completely irrelevant of what the generator is. And uh, yes, so the, the gradient updates can be done with any gradient-based learning rule, uh, and this also permits the, the uh, utilization of, for example, the ADAM optimizer, which is uh, quite efficient uh, and, uh, and uh, elastic, let's say, optimizer to many different hyperparameters. And uh, as you can see, the initial samples generated by the GAM paper, although they were good for the time, 2014, because <laughs> this field evolves fast, so 2014 is a very long time uh, from, uh, from the machine learning perspective, they were nowhere near comparable, the samples that we can see today in uh, most of the GAM models. And uh, this is because uh, soon after this paper, many different papers uh, uh, came out with different small improvements, uh, tweaks and hacks to make the whole the overall generative adversarial uh, framework work better. And uh, therefore also in this tutorial we will not uh, simply re-implement the original GAM paper but we will look uh, one year afterwards to one of the papers that uh, represented uh, probably the first major breakthrough and uh, or at least popularized breakthrough in the generative adversarial learning, which is probably DC GAN, uh, deep convolutional GAN, and um, yeah, so this is the this is the original paper. It was published in 2015, and uh, this paper uh, by Alec uh, Radford simply uh, popularized uh, and uh, advertised different uh, training tweaks uh, and. Uh, and, uh, and the differences uh, in optimization objectives that made, uh, that played a very, very big effect in the making the training of GANs uh, more stable. So, um, there are two, let's say, main, uh, main changes that this paper introduced. The first one uh, are discriminator and generator architecture guidelines. So, we mentioned before that discriminator and generator are deep neural networks. But there are 10,000 different ways, especially nowadays, that you can actually make a neural network. You can design the architecture of a neural network. And uh, this paper gave some very solid guidelines, which worked well for most datasets and most problems, which were used uh, for many years to come. Um, yeah, firstly, whenever utilizing uh, convolutions, so when working with two-dimensional data, this paper refuted the utilization of pooling layers and instead proposed uh, simple strided convolutions or fractionally strided convolutions for the generator. And uh, then it proposed the utilization of batch normalization, which uh, still now is very much used in almost uh, all most su successful models and uh, rem removed the fully connected hidden layers for deeper architectures, instead just utilized a fully convolutional design and uh, said uh, to use ReLU nonlinearities uh, for the activation in the generators and leaky ReLU for the discriminator. This might seem like very trivial, uh, very trivial differences, but uh, in practice, when actually training GANs, uh, they make uh, a very huge effect. Because if we go back to the optimization objective, we can see that uh, by one network bringing this value up and the other one 
bringing the same value down, it can create uh, a lot of instability or it can create a lot of saturating potential when uh, simply one network is too powerful for the other to get any meaningful gradient signal out of the optimization. And to overcome, again, this difficulty, I believe there was a second major change that um, this paper at least popularized, which was uh, the use of, uh, of moving away from a minimax game in which the generator and this discriminator would be trying to maximize and minimize the same objective. But instead, they proposed a non-saturated uh, objective uh, for, the, for the generator. And um, this basically said that the generator, instead of, uh, instead of minimizing, uh, minimizing the, the cross-entropy loss for the, for the discriminator, uh, just was just to be optimized by maximizing the log probability of its samples uh, being uh, classified as real. So instead of having a minimax loss when the generator would uh, just try to minimize the same objective, we move away and we just move to an optimization where the generator tries to instead maximize the log probability of, of the log predicted probability of its samples from the, from the discriminator. And to understand why this makes a difference in the optimization, um, the best way is to, yeah, is to visualize what the two functions actually represent. So in this graph, uh, the blue curve is the original minimax objective, while the grid curve is the non-saturating heuristic objective uh, popularized by DCGAN. And uh, one key thing that uh, is important to understand uh, the difference in optimizing uh, these two objectives is uh, visualizing the gradient of these two curves. So here on the x-axis we can see the probability that the discriminator assigns to the generated samples, while on the y-axis we can see the actual, uh, the actual objective function for the, for the generator. And, uh, as we can see in the original uh, non, uh, in the original minimax uh, heuristic, the gradient would be extremely steep for uh, for when the generator probability would be close to one, while it would be almost flat when the generator probability would be close to zero. And this is equivalent to saying that when the generator already is able to to produce very good samples, so the discriminator probability it's close to one, the gradient would be steeper, hence the optimization would be more aggressive. While when the, instead the generator would not be able to effectively produce any good samples, then the gradient would be almost flat, and so there would be, all, be almost no learning signal passed to the generator weights. And this is extremely unwanted because uh, in case the discriminator simply becomes good at discriminating uh, generated from, uh, from, from real sample, the generator would uh, effectively stop any learning. Uh, and uh, therefore, that's why the non-saturated uh, non, uh, lo non uh, loss was proposed. Because by just flipping, uh, let's say, the optimization objective and maximizing the log probability, we can see that uh, the, the log of a value, the, the derivative of the log of a value, it's extremely high when that value is small. Because uh, log, of, log of x, the derivative of log of x is 1 over x. So if the generated probability would be far off the original objective, uh, the actual gradient signal would be much higher. And this again was one of the key implementation changes that really pushed uh, GANs to the next level and uh, allowed for a myriad of uh, further paper to bring these concepts and implement them further in uh, many further works exploring the applications of GANs on many datasets and with uh, many variations, really bringing forward the, li the literature of the whole topic. And uh, here, for example, on the MNIST dataset, we can see a small comparison, uh, on the left uh, there are the true digits coming from the actual distribution, human distributions that generated uh, the dataset. In the center we can see the samples uh, from uh, the original GAN paper. And on the right we can see the samples from the DC GAN paper. And 
if you can compare them visually, I believe it's um, relatively clear that they're much sharper and uh, they represent better the true underlying distribution. They're closer to the true underlying distribution. And uh, yeah, for the second part of, um, of this tutorial, we will be doing a small implementation and small live coding session trying to replicate uh, these results. So first I will see if there are, um, if there are any questions, uh, if there are any posts. Uh, it doesn't seem there are any. So we can probably move forward. Um, regarding, I will check if there are any messages in case I'm having problems with my stream. No, okay. Seems that everything is working, so that's a good sign. So let's, let's move on to the second part uh, and uh, move on to the live, uh, live coding session. So again, we will be working with the MNIST dataset uh, simply because of a uh, time constraint. Uh, training models, uh, deep models in general, takes a very long time, uh, especially GANs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, because you're actually training not just one model, but two models. But uh, let's see if we can replicate uh, the results. So I will, I will walk through all the code. Uh, much of it was already written. Um, first of all, uh, let's see if I can increase the size of the notebook, as it might be a bit small on your view. Um, so settings, it should be here. Yeah, font size, I will increase it so you guys can see better, maybe a bit more. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it. So. Firstly, training utilities. Um, here there are just some uh, functions that uh, I made uh, just to display the samples, get a random batch from um, a given data set, train the, a model that we're going to see further its, 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 its structure by simply given, uh, so train a model for an epoch uh, and train a model, uh, train GAN, which is the general training function, which given uh, a GAN model, which is both a generator and discriminator and some data, a batch size, a number of epochs, uh, samples to display just to show throughout the different training iterations uh, a few samples generated by our generator. Uh, then uh, discriminator steps per update, so this was our k value. Generator steps per update, so the number of times to update the generator per, uh, per iteration of GAN training. Um, and uh, well, with whatever frequency to log our results and uh, show the samples. And uh, yeah, similarly, train epochs um, is called uh, many times from our training GAN function. And simply for each update uh, that it performs, uh, performs the uh, relative uh, steps of discriminator, generator training, and uh, logging every time that's needed. But let's dig into our models, which is likely the most interesting part. So I will be using uh, TensorFlow for this tutorial, uh, TensorFlow 2.0. Everything should be directly translatable to PyTorch, but if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to ask me. I will, I will gladly address those. So, um, firstly, we can see the basic setup for our model is that we have a generator and discriminator. They're very much uh, boilerplate uh, classes, um, simply taking as input uh, layers, in this case, Keras layers, and uh, when they are called, so when we call uh, these classes, um, the, the function that runs is simply here, run layers, that for every layer it outputs uh, the output of a layer. So if we feed it in uh, the different layers of a network, the run layers will go through each layer of a network and uh, take our input and modify it according to the given layer. And uh, so our generator and discriminator are two identical models. So the generator will output the generated image and the discriminator will output the probability. Uh, particularly the generator, we will implement it, uh, we will show an implementation of the layers of the generator later, utilizing um, this again uh, structure, a structure that was in the DC GAN paper. But um, yes, by, by, by default it's just, uh, it's just uh, a class, uh, it's just a class that represents a neural network. And now probably the most interesting class, which is the simple GAN, which takes as input the noise dimensionality. This will just be the dimensionality of our fixed prior noise distribution, a generator model, a discriminator model, so which is just a simple network with a bunch of layers, 
then a non-saturating parameter, just saying if we want to use the saturating loss or non-saturating loss for the generator, and uh, the different optimizers for both generator and discriminator. And by default, uh, just add them with uh, one, a 10 to the minus 3 <laughs> learning rate, which happens to work uh, quite well for most problems, not only in generative adversarial network. And uh, so, after we start our function, we define our input distribution, which would be our noise distribution, if you might say, uh, which is just a multivariate uh, Gaussian with uh, a non-dependent Gaussian um, with the localization or mean zero and the scale one, standard deviation one. Um, yeah, so we save our generator as a gen, our discriminator as disk, and our both, both are optimizers. Now, I've already made most of the code because of um, timing constraints. However, there are a few functions uh, that uh, would need to be still implemented just to show you guys how to actually implement the loss uh, very, very easily based on the equations that uh, you saw above, but just show you a version of the implementations. So, um, as you can see, those four loss, loss, losses are, um, those four functions uh, with the three losses are the function we want to implement. And I made the rest of the training codes such that after this function's output uh, um, generate uh, outputs the generated images and uh, the various losses output the loss for the various models, we can just run the whole, um, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole notebook uh, and actually obtain, uh, train and obtain good examples on our dataset. So firstly, in order to generate samples, we have our input distribution which is uh, our input distribution of noise. Um, so we can just uh, get some uh, latent vari some, uh, some variables z, let's say, from our noise distribution. So we can just say z is equal to the input distribution. And then from here, we can use uh, the sample function with the, as input uh, the number of uh, elements we want to sample, and in this case, batch size, which represents the number of samples that we want to generate. And then from here, starting from RZ, we can just uh, return the output of our generator. So self.gen that we define here, taking as input, again, the generated uh, noise distribution. So the generated samples from our noise distribution. And this, after we implement the generator with uh, a neural network structure, which uh, is consistent uh, with the structure of our images, will output uh, the current predicted samples. Of course, initially, they're just going to be meaningless noise. But as we train, they're going to improve uh, and eventually be samples, if everything goes well, similar to what uh, the data distribution uh, is. So then we implement the discriminator loss. In this case, uh, we have two inputs, so a batch of real data and the fake data n, which just the number of samples to generate and evaluate uh, for, our, for our discriminator. So again, we can use the functions we just implemented and say generated samples is equal to the calling the generate function. So self.generate with the, as input uh, the number of uh, fake data samples that we want to generate with our generator. So fake data n. Uh, we already have uh, the real data samples uh, passed through into this function. And so from here, all that's left is evaluating the probabilities predicted by our discriminator and setting up uh, the, the cross-entropy loss defined above. So we can evaluate uh, both probability by just running the discriminator on the different uh, batches of data. So generated uh, likelihoods, we can call it which will be, therefore, the probabilities predicted of our, by our discriminator of our generated sample. We can just call the discriminator on the generated samples, which, again, the discriminator is a network which will output the probability. So we give you, we give us, after we implemented, the predicted value for the, for the likelihood of our generated samples. So on our generated samples. And uh, then we can uh, say our real data samples or real data likelihood, simply with the same thing, but uh, this time with the discriminator network, this time uh, just outputting the probability for um, our real data. 
and subsequently we can uh, again I will show you again we can utilize our cross entropy objective and implement it in order to train D as a classifier and uh, yeah with uh, with the X having labels one and uh, and uh, our generated data having labels zero so again we can from here just define uh, the screen disk objective for example and we can say is equal to the log probability of yeah, math.log is equal to log of our generated uh, of our real data likelihoods plus the log this time of 1 minus our generated likelihoods and then again this is our objective but uh, as we want as we want a loss because uh, we want to minimize the loss instead of maximizing the objective we can just uh, multiply our objective by minus one uh, to get effectively the loss such that minimizing the loss corresponds to maximizing the objective so we can just return the mean throughout all our samples of uh, minus one times the discriminator objective and now we can implement uh, two different versions of the generator loss the first one that's uh, based uh, on the on the original GAM paper, so just minimizing the same objective that the discriminator is maximizing. So we can probably copy paste to be faster. So we can get our generated samples by simply running our generated model on on, on uh, the noise on the noise data. So by running our generate function uh, with the, the number of fake samples we want to generate. And uh, then we can uh, get, again, our generated likelihoods by running our discriminator models on the generated samples. And uh, lastly, we can uh, obtain, let's say, the generator loss, this time that we want to directly minimize, as uh, simply the same, uh, the same optimization as we did above for the discriminator. But this time we can ignore the first term as it's completely independent of any generator value. And we can return, for example, the mean of, of this loss. Of the generator loss. Perfect. And um, yeah, again, um, this running this would likely work on simpler problems, but if we want to have a more effective method, uh, we want to make it such that when the discriminator is able to correctly label our generated samples, the gradient is high and hence the generator moves away quickly from uh, from such bad uh, local minima and uh, therefore we can implement a non-saturating generator loss which will be very similar to our generator loss but uh, with the key differences that this time instead of a generator loss we have a generator objective that we want to maximize and this generator objective corresponds to instead of one minus the log probab the probabilities corresponds to maximizing the log probabilities of the generator samples. And so, as here again we're asked to output a loss, we can just multiply the generator objective by minus one. Um, so the rest, of the, the rest of the code is simply implementation details uh, related to TensorFlow. So here uh, the, the function is just uh, evaluating uh, to, to make the discriminator training operations and generator training operations we are just inside the gradient tape uh, evaluating the discriminator and generator loss and applying the gradients but it's 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 related to TensorFlow and uh, probably for the for the ones of you which are more familiar with PyTorch you can safely ignore these bits but uh, yeah most importantly is that here we're simply following uh, the mathematics uh, that was uh, shown in, uh, in the two papers and by simply implementing this method we get a working gun method uh, if there are no bugs which probably you guys have already spotted somewhere but uh, I haven't been paying much attention so then we can uh, look at uh, the MMIS dataset so firstly we can start by um, run before everything that was uh, already given in this uh, collab so we can start defining all our variables here I mean this uh, 
In this code cell, we will be just training on MNIST. So firstly, we will be importing the MNIST data and uh, simply normalizing it. Here you can see just um, converting it to float 32 because NumPy has the very nice habit of keeping everything as float 64 because they don't really care about efficiency apparently. And uh, yeah, converting everything to float 32 and uh, dividing by the maximum number because initially the training data is between uh, it's, is, uh, is uh, quantized between 0 and 255. So we want to convert it to a float and divide by 255. So we normalize it in the range 0 to 1. And uh, yeah, in these code cells, then we just display some random data. And as you can see, here are real samples from the MNIST dataset. Secondly, we implement, uh, here I've made the implementations to make the, to make the class uh, more concise. Here we can implement uh, the generator and discriminator network based on the, um, on the specifications given in the DCGAM paper. So for the generator, the MNIST generator, this will just be a class which will, uh, will, uh, will inherit from the generator class and simply define a bunch of layers and then pass the layers to, the, to its superclass. So that's, uh, that's a way to extend uh, and, uh, and define your own custom methods, but uh, that's, it's totally irrelevant to the actual implementation. And the layers that I've uh, used this time is uh, initially given the noise source, here I'll define an input shape of 74, but uh, that's also not, uh, not uh, particularly important. We first apply so a, dent, a fully connected dense layer of 1024 and uh, yeah, batch normalization uh, and, acti and ReLU as, uh, as mentioned in the DCGAM paper. Then we apply a further dense layer to bring the dimension up to, se uh, to 7 times 7 times 128. Again, batch normalization and ReLU. Secondly, we reshape uh, our input to be an image because we want our generator to be an image. So we reshape it to have, uh, to have size n by 7 by 7 by 128. By 128. And uh, yeah, then we apply a transpose convolution, which for those of you who know what it is, you can understand it as some sort of convolution that upscales uh, the input uh, instead of downscales it which uh, with the with strides uh, two by two uh, and this effectively therefore brings uh, our input uh, and makes it uh, increases the spatial dimension uh, by by twice by two times effectively making uh, at this point uh, our generated samples uh, for, uh, n by 14 by 14 uh, by 64, as we have 64 filters, and uh, we apply after again batch normalization and ReLU, we apply one filer and come come to the transpose layer. Um, yeah, again with the strides uh, two by two. Uh, with uh, this time, therefore, again doubling uh, our width and the height dimension to get an output that's 28 uh, times 28 times uh, one, because we have uh, just one filter. We utilize only one filter here. And finally, we apply the sigmoid activation uh, to, to the input. This is just so that, um, because the original MNIST images were normalized in the range zero to one, we want our output to also be zero to one. And the sigmoid function effectively brings, uh, brings whatever number you fit it in into a range that's capped within zero and one. Um, but it, it's just related to the, our choice of data set and our choice of normalization. Instead, uh, for example, we could have uh, normalized our input in the range minus one to one and uh, utilized uh, a ton h nonlinearity in the end that instead brings our input uh, to a range, again, minus one to one, the ton h function. Uh, subsequently, subsequently, we have uh, the discriminator. We define our custom discriminator for the MNIST data set. Uh, which again will take as input uh, an MNIST image, uh, which is 28 by 28 by 1. Uh, from this MNIST image, it will apply uh, strided convolutions. Uh, again, as mentioned in the in the in the DCGAM paper. Um, so here, are 64 channels. So bringing our dimensionality down. Um, then a leaky relu again, a strided convolution. And then batch normalization, leaky relu again. It will reshape uh, our image at this point to be flat, 
and finally apply two dense layers. Uh, the first dense layer followed by batch normalization and leaky relu, and the second dense layer with a dimensionality of one, so effectively getting for each image that we have one output. So here our output will just be an n by one, uh, an n by one uh, vector or matrix, if you like, with uh, a sigmoid activation. And this again will bring uh, our input uh, to a range that's within a zero and one, which in this case is convenient because we want our discriminator to output a probability, and the probability is within zero and one. And uh, yeah, so this is ideal for our particular case, output a normalized probability. So we can run this code to define our custom models. And here simply we define our generator, we define our discriminator, and we initialize our GAN with the um, yeah, noise dimensionality here is 128. We can make it 74 to be consistent with the, with the, with the models, but uh, it will probably work regardless. Um, and uh, we can define, for example, non-saturating to be true to test our non-saturating objective. And we can define our optimizers. Um, here I've slightly decreased the learning rate as Usually, we're, when working with um, with GANs, it's it's good to have uh, a smaller learning rate uh, or even uh, decay the learning rate either linearly or in steps when when optimizing, together with also tweaking the beta variables. But uh, it's for, it's not needed on the GAN dataset. Here, it's just uh, something uh, that needs to be done for Keras to understand to apply batch normalization properly. But uh, yeah, again, for those of you who <laughs> Who, who are familiar with PyTorch, uh, close your eyes. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's not really relevant uh, to anything in PyTorch. And here we run our optimization utilizing again the tra train GAN function that we earlier defined with a batch size of 128 uh, for 20 epochs uh, and at the end of each epoch displaying uh, 10 of our samples that we generated. And if everything goes well and we didn't, uh, we didn't make any mistakes in the small implementations that we made, yeah, it should start optimizing uh, Again, here we define uh, one single discriminator and generator update uh, for each uh, learning iteration. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's logging the different losses uh, for, um, for, uh, for uh, the different training iterations. And uh, yeah, as you can see, one, uh, one detail is that um, unlike uh, training supervised model, the loss for each component does not necessarily go up or down because uh, it's an adversarial process rather than um, one network uh, trying to optimize a loss function given a data set. Hence, uh, it's, it's quite unstable, uh, the, the actual losses that you get for different training iterations, as uh, the two models are trying to optimize uh, pretty much competing objectives. And uh, yeah, it seems that we didn't make any mistake, as the samples that are generated throughout the different epochs on the MNIST data appear to be increasingly more realistic, initially further from the original data set, but uh, as we can see, yeah, they're, they're getting closer. Here, for example, we're training for 20 epochs, but likely they would be getting even closer if uh, instead of this, we train for more epochs, uh, decaying potentially the learning rate throughout the different epochs. And uh, yeah, I believe the 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 samples can be understood as being good enough at this point. So we can uh, possibly even uh, stop training. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, let's let's do 10 epochs uh, and then uh, stop training. In the meantime, I'll see if there are any questions. Um, you are in the wrong classroom, Eduardo. No. All right. I hope I haven't made any mistake. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see, so, so 10 epochs, we can stop, uh, we can stop training at this point, as I believe the samples are, are good enough, uh, just for you guys to show you, you can definitely try different data set, different, um, different models, uh, extending this code, again, for those of you who joined a bit later, this will be all uh, posted on the tutorials page, uh, on the GitHub tutorials page for, um, for the AI core. And finally, we can uh, visualize uh, our losses. Oh no, to visualize our losses, we need to first fully train, of course, because otherwise the, the two variables are not defined. So let's, let's run this again, maybe for fewer epochs. 
as I believe even after five we got uh, pretty decent samples. And that just goes to show how simple uh, the, the MNIST dataset is. I will check if maybe I received a few messages related to that. Uh, to that, uh, to that, uh, you're not getting the messages. Yeah, in fact, I was not getting the messages. I was in the wrong class. Ah, the questions are in the classroom. Ah, let's see. Let's see if I can, if I can access them uh, the classroom. I'm sorry, guys. This is the first time I'm using this, and I was introduced to this literally ten minutes before the, <laughs> before the actual, uh, before the actual. Uh, for the actual class so uh, wait let's do like that I will try to call uh, Andrew in the meantime and see if he can help me to see how to actually go to the classroom I will put him That's okay. hey Andrew Oh, so yeah. You go to, uh, slash app. Okay. The app. Uh, but you go to, you go to the slash app? Ah. I see. And from here? So, uh, Login. Yeah. Okay. Um, classroom, not open hacking. No. Um, where shall I go from here? Yeah. Open hacking or? Um, I should. No, go to um, so menu. Hmm. Ah, classroom. Oh, sorry. Okay, perfect. Click to join, and here I guess I will see the different questions. Hopefully. Sorry, guys. Again, this was less than ideal. Ah, yeah. oh, right. The icon where the is, where is the main image mark? What is it? What are you running? Are you for us? Ah, thank you. I see you already answered nice. most of the most of the questions. Thanks a lot. No, no I guess that was very helpful. All right, now I can see finally the I can finally see the questions. Um, yeah, finally um, from our um, from our notebook. Uh, now we trained for the five iterations. Um, and as you can see here, we can visualize uh, the different losses for generator and discriminator. And uh, as we can see, the losses are clearly unstable, <laughs> let's say. They do not converge to any value specifically. And this is also one of the key problems in GAN optimization, is that it's extremely difficult uh, to evaluate whether the model that was built has converged or even how good the model was as a loss function of any kinds on any data set is not very much indicative. Uh, people have been using uh, different, uh, different methods uh, in the literature, such as uh, you might have heard of inception score or uh, fresh at inception distance, but they're all pretty much heuristics. And uh, hence, a very common way to evaluate uh, how good the GAN is is simply by qualitatively visualizing the different samples and uh, seeing if they actually match the true data distribution. But uh, yeah, then again, uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was it for this tutorial. Uh, I will see now if there are any particular questions, but uh, I've taken uh, the, the figures uh, from uh, these three papers, which you can find on archive. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, here is also my email. Uh, you can you can further contact me. And um, otherwise, uh, uh, now I will see if there are any particular questions which I will try to answer. But um, otherwise, I guess I will see you in the next in the next uh, tutorial. So um, let's see uh, if there are any questions. Can you hear your fan spin up when? I <laughs> well, I'm on my laptop, so unfortunately. Uh, that's inevitable. What is the noise dimensionality? So noise dimensionality, as defined in the notebook, is uh, the dimensionality of our noise distribution. So if you see the um, if you see the original equation, so when we when we say when we say when we're optimizing that we draw samples uh, from uh, 
draw M noise samples from our noise prior. The noise prior is some uh, fixed distribution that just outputs uh, noise variables. In my case, it was a random normal distribution with a fixed standard deviation and uh, a fixed mean. Um, however, because we want our input uh, to be varied, such that uh, the GAN can output a diverse set of samples, um, we can just have uh, our, noise, uh, our noise prior to output uh, multiple independent uh, variables uh, from, uh, from, for example, a normal distribution in our case. Hence, representing a multivariate normal distribution. And noise dimensionality simply says um, what is the dimensionality of our multivariate uh, normal distribution. That's, that's, that's basically it. So, uh, why are we returning the mean of the loss? Well, because um, we want to train with the mini batch gradient descent, uh, with the stochastic gradient descent. And um, because, therefore, our loss will be a different, uh, a different value for um, each of our training examples uh, from the, either the real data or from the generated, exam or from the generated samples. Um, hence, uh, we are returning the mean because we want a scalar that we can optimize uh, with our, uh, with our, with our automatic, automatic uh, differentiation software, ideally. Um, so, will you make the notebook available? Yeah, I guess this was answered. The notebook is already available. Um, so are you using Python 2 or 3? Uh, Python 3? Um, sorry, missed the first five minutes. Trying to generate uh, human like a generator, trying to generate human like written numbers. So, generators are trying to generate uh, whatever data that came from our initial distribution. And um, if our Initial distribution is the MNIST dataset uh, in this case, which is just handwritten digits. Then uh, it will try to generate uh, handwritten digits. If it was images, again, <laughs> I will point you to these videos in which uh, training for uh, quite more time than we did, and with a model that was much deeper than our model, and with uh, a lot of uh, further hacks, uh, they were able to generate extremely high quality images of people that uh, do not actually exist. Um, what does the where does the half come from in non-saturating loss? Um, that's just how the paper in which I've taken that figure from um, defined the loss. But you, you can ignore the half. In their paper, they they when 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 we were optimizing the minimax objective, they actually put uh, two coefficients of half in front of both um, discriminator and and uh, and generator term. Um, just uh, because it, the reason is actually will go a bit, uh, will delve a bit deeper on what uh, the actual uh, optimizing the cross entropy objective uh, signifies, what optimizing this objective with respect to the discriminator signifies. But uh, if we put uh, two halves in front, uh, both of uh, the first half of the optimization and the second half of the optimization, it recovers something called the uh, 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 Shannon divergence. Um, optimizing the discriminator optimizes the Shannon, uh, uh, the, the Shannon divergence uh, between our real data and our fake data with respect to the generator variables. But then that again goes much deeper into the math than what is needed to in this tutorial. And uh, I will point you to the original GAM paper, which uh, again you will be able to find uh, at the very end of, uh, of, of this notebook uh, by Goodfellow et al. for if you want to know further details about the derivations of the method. And um, yeah, so could you break down the key equation? Yeah. This, 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 was, uh, this was already answered. Maximize the probability which yeah, the discriminator predicts the samples and then minimizes the probability. Yeah, yes, this, was, this, was great, uh, this was great explanation, I believe. Uh, special guest alert. Uh, All right, so I think. Uh, I think this was everything for today. Thank you guys for hanging out. It was a pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, a topic that's, uh, that's at the very core of uh, much recent research. Um, throughout my research, I've been working also a lot with, uh, with GANs, uh, but uh, more in the realm of uh, inverse reinforcement learning, which is again a very interesting topic, which if we will get a chance, we will definitely introduce uh, at the AI core. So thanks a lot guys for coming and for participating. I think this was great. Uh
have uh, have a nice rest of your day and uh, have a nice week goodbye